Hi, my name is Dr. John Ripoli. I'm a functional medicine practitioner in Jacksonville, Florida. And in this lecture, we're going to be talking about hormone therapy, holistic, natural, and functional options. The lecture outline is as follows. We're going to discuss the difference between, say, functional or holistic versus the more traditional or conventional approaches that are currently being used. We'll give a real brief synopsis about endocrinology 101, which is really simply the study of hormones and the glands that are associated with their production. We'll talk about some practical uh, information regarding diagnostics, such as the difference between saliva, blood, and urine testing. Whenever you see the symbol here, the KISS symbol, uh, this is for the acronym Keep It Simple Stupid. And this really is just, you know, to kind of show you on the different uh, slides as we go through this, which are the most important pertinent information uh, to really be, uh, dr you know, drilling in uh, that is important to remember. And then we'll give you a really simple outline of a five-step program or protocol that you can implement immediately. So signs and symptoms of hormone imbalance are extremely broad and systemic, meaning they affect the entire body. So we have just like generalized fatigue as an example to musculoskeletal related issues like pain as well as headaches. It can even affect our memory and our cognition. And then women, of course, they can suffer with heavy menses or breast tenderness, water retention. Uh, such conditions as hypothyroid can affect our weight. Uh, we can get loss of muscle mass. We can have mental health, quote, unquote, related issues, such as depression and mood swings, loss of libido or sex drive, hot flashes, night sweats, sleep disorders, and so forth. So before we move forward, I just want to talk about or define some simple nomenclature because we'll be using some of these terms throughout the rest of this presentation. So again, endocrine system refers to all the glands of the human body, such as the thyroid, the pancreas, the ovaries, the uterus, the testes, that produce these specific chemicals called hormones. So when we look at the communication you know, between the human body here, there's really, in general, three different types of communication that we can have. Hormones is one of them. And hormones really refers to um, a chemical that is released in one part of the body that travels long distances to affect another part. So this is long distance type of communication. Paracrine communication, para means around, is signaling in the form of one cell affecting a nearby cell. And then autocrine is a signaling in which a cell secretes, say, a hormone or chemical that binds to receptors in the same cell. So if we look at you know, hormones as an example, a hormone travels long distances and then finally gets to the target and let's say it encounters a particular cell that it wants to communicate with. It will then attach to the cell membrane and it will go into a very specific part called the receptor. And once it fits like a lock and key, then the information is then transmitted into the cell uh, to direct it to do a certain function um, or take a certain action. Xenobiotics is another term. Uh, xeno means foreign, biotic means life. So these are substances that are literally foreign to life, such as pesticides and herbicides, uh, or even plasticizers, or you know, from, from some of the plastics uh, cups that we drink, or uh, you know, some of the receipt paper that we touch. And what they do is that they have a very important effect. As an example, they may uh, dis disrupt um, uh, the hormone signaling by actually going into the receptor site and then creating misinformation into that cell. Phytohormones, phyto means plant, and these are plant compounds or chemicals that are very similar in nature uh, to our own hormones, but they're not hormones per se. So as an example, in soy-based products, there's something called phyto, which is plant, phytoestrogens. And they have an estrogenic type of effect. 
but it's actually a beneficial effect, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit uh, later on, as compared to, say, you know, these bastardized versions of soy products, such as soy hot dogs and hamburgers and soy chips, they don't particularly have the beneficial phytoestrogens. In fact, some of the substances that are in them are actually very disruptive to hormone signaling. Endogenous means internal production of hormones. And this is really what we're wanting to kind of work on, is really how do we find a way to get our endogenous production back to normal? exogenous refers to hormones from the outside world in. So this could be everything from hormone replacement therapy to xenobiotics to the food that we eat, in particularly factory farm meat like dairy and chicken and red meat. Uh, most of the animals that are being raised are being injected purposely with hormones. And so when we eat the flesh of these animals, we are in turn ingesting the hormones as well. So we're going to look at functional versus conventional treatment. So the traditional model I would refer to as the replacement model. So we have somebody who goes into the doctor's office, male, who has low testosterone. You don't need a medical degree. You would prescribe testosterone. Or a female who goes into the doctor's office and their blood work shows that they have low progesterone you would then prescribe progesterone. So it's symptom-based. It's not really taking into account or asking the question, why do they have low testosterone or, or progesterone? It's just going ahead and giving that which they're finding deficient. Now they have two options. You know, so let's say it's a 50-year-old male. They have two options, and that is to look up the reference range for a 50-year-old male and then give them the quantity of hormone that would be sufficient enough to raise their hormone levels to meet the criteria uh, of somebody within that reference range who is, say, 50 years old. The other option, of course, is to do more youth aspiring. So as an example, um, they would find out a male has low testosterone or a woman low progesterone. They're both 50 years old. But now they would look at the reference ranges, say, for somebody who is in their 20s. And they would give the hormone in an amount so that way they can raise up artificially their hormones to meet the reference range of a male or a female who is in, say, their second or third decade of life. Now, the functional approach to endocrinology is quite different. It's a matrix model. It understands that hormones are produced like a symphony and that it's a domino effect. You affect one hormone, you're going to affect the whole chain. So it's really asking one additional question, and that is, which we hinted out before, why does this particular person, as an example, have low testosterone? Or why does this particular woman have low progesterone? And so it's really wanting to find out the causative nature. And we'll show you a couple of examples, very, very common examples, of what could be some of the underlying causes for some of these deficiency-related issues. But the major goal with functional endocrinology is the restoration of the body's self-regulation powers. So in other words, we're wanting to coax our body so that way the endogenous production of hormones is restored. And we don't really want to do that in, say, the traditional way by incarcerating somebody for the rest of their life through exogenous intake of synthetic hormone. So when we look at, say, endocrinology 101, we're going to keep this really simple. But we have different glands in the body. We have the thyroid, the parathyroid, the adrenals, the pancreas, the ovaries, and the testes. And really, they're all taking their messages from higher up or higher centers, which are really coming from the brain, which is really the hypothalamus and the pituitary. So some oftentimes they'll call it the hypothalamus pituitary axis, or the, in the case of the adrenals, it would be the HPA axis, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal. In other words, you're getting a signaling mechanism from the brain down to the glands, 
the glands then in turn will perform an action which is the production of hormones which then will travel long distances uh, to uh, create whatever change that is necessary that the brain um, is detecting. So when you look at um, some of the pituitary hormones, right, you have some of them are named appropriate, like TSH, most people have heard of, which is thyroid stimulating hormone. And this particular hormone does exactly what it says. It goes to the thyroid gland and it stimulates it to produce the thyroid hormones. That's why, you know, people probably, if, you know, if you've ever noticed in your blood work, it's kind of counterintuitive, but high levels of TSH is actually referring to a decreased function of thyroid production because when the brain is actually pushing out thyroid stimulating hormone, that means it's detecting low levels of thyroid hormone in the blood. So higher levels of TSH, as an example, would mean that the thyroid gland is not producing enough thyroid hormone. And you can see there's all sorts of different hormones like FSH and LH and grow hor uh, growth hormone and prolactin and so forth. So we talked a little bit about this before, but just to kind of show you again on this schematic, uh, the body produces a hormone, the hormone travels, it will go into a receptor on a cell just like a lock and a key and then it will initiate some type of response. So when you look at this picture right here, you can see that a steroid hormone is actually tagging onto a receptor in the cell membrane and then eventually that hormone is going to travel to the DNA and actually induce gene activity. So as we look at this next slide here, we're going to see that there's different things that can happen with hormone communication. So the first one is that you get a normal response. You know, hormone is produced, that hormone travels to the cell, it goes to the cell receptor like a lock and key, and then the information is transferred into the cell for some sort of action that might be for gene translation or on the DNA. But we can have blocked type of communication. So if you remember those xenobiotics or those substances that are foreign to life, they're also called endocrine disruptors. But imagine if these guys go into the receptor site that might be for say estrogen or progesterone and they block it. So now you're not really getting a signaling mechanism inside the cell anymore when your body produces a particular hormone. Another thing that can happen is, you know, in the case that the example that we gave before with hypothyroid is that our body is just not producing enough, say, thyroid hormone. So we're not getting enough signaling onto the receptors because of an insufficient amount of production of hormones. And then, of course, we can have an excessive. So as an example with, say, stress hormone cortisol, we can have way too much production of cortisol. And when that happens, we have a really high level or high amount of hormone that's infiltrating the receptor sites, creating more of an excessive type of response uh, to the cells. And the body and its infinite wisdom, you know, you guys may have heard of something called insulin resistance. So insulin, of course, is a hormone. It's produced by the pancreas. And its main objective or job is to take sugar out of the bloodstream and into the cell. But, you know, if you're over abusing, you know, uh, sugar, uh, sugary foods, well, what's going to happen is you're going to get an overproduction of insulin. And so what the body actually does is it downregulates in the sense that the receptors for insulin that are surrounding the cell, the body or the cell actually takes them away. And you get what is referred to as insulin sensitivity, which then will lead to diabetes because now the blood sugar is going to be elevated because the sugar uh, can't get into uh, the cell. So when we look at hormone communication, the one, the most important thing to understand is that the traditional replacement model of hormone usage 
really only can deal with the insufficient amount. It doesn't really have any way of dealing with blocked or excessive production uh, of hormone imbalances in the human body. And also, of course, with the insufficient, it doesn't really address the domino or the symphony-like reactions that occur uh, with hormone uh, communication throughout the body. One of the things that we had mentioned earlier was uh, soy-based products. And we were talking about something called phyto, which is plant-type estrogen components that are found in soy products. So if we look at edamame, which is the actual soybean, you can take it and heat it and curdle it and make uh, something called tofu, or you can take it and ferment it and make a product like tempeh or miso. These are the traditional soy-based products that, as an example, some of the elder Okinawians or you know some of these uh, studies done on centenarians, people over 100, they were eating soy-based products uh, in large quantities, and they had protective mechanisms against uterine, prostate, breast cancers. And one of the reasons is because these phytoestrogens actually have a beneficial effect that we alluded to before. So in other words, when they go into the body, they kind of act like a thermos. A thermos keeps hot things hot or cold things cold. And they actually literally adapt into the environment in which they go. It has an adaptogenic property. So if it goes into a, a female's body who has an over excessive production of estrogen, these phytoestrogens will attach to the receptors and will decrease or block the amount of estrogen activity. If it enters into a female's body who has an under production of estrogen, it will go to these receptor sites and it will actually create an estrogenic type of uh, response. And if you look at the parallel then to some of these, you know, bastardized soy products that we talked about before, like soy hot dogs and soy hamburgers and so forth, they really only have one choice when they enter in the body. And that is more of a proliferative type of effect, uh, which means that the hormone communication really is an excessive one. And so we just want to make sure, you know, to, to not pigeonhole or put all soy based products into the, into the same category. So I throw this slide in because I, I really think it's quite interesting, but it's also quite profound in the reason why we need a multidimensional treatment plan uh, for hormones. So the old model, which I've reviewed, is this lock and key mechanism such that you know, our body communicates by producing these little chemicals that travel long distances, go inside like a lock and a key to communicate information. But this chemical model is insufficient to explain the almost instantaneous response um, that the human body can go through, as an example, when it's in love or when it's in a state of fear. It's almost like every single cell in the human body gets coordinated or resonated. Uh, think about this. We have about 50 to 100 trillion cells in the human body. Over 100,000 reactions occur in just a single cell every second. So there's no way that this biochemical model can explain the rate of speed for communication throughout the human body. And we already kind of intuitively know this. So as an example, in the picture on the upper left, that's a picture of a synapse. So we know that the, you know, the brain and the spinal cord really communicate through electrical impulses. The picture in the middle is of uh, an MRI machine, and we know that the an MRI machine is called a magnetic resonance imaging. It's picking up the magnetic energy from the atoms of the human body, so the electrical information from the spiraling atoms of the human body. When we eat food, it's information, right? So as an example, we can look at a picture of organic versus an inorganic uh, piece of broccoli, and we can see that the organic broccoli on the left has a, a more light energy that's actually traveling into the human body for communication. We know when we hook somebody up to an EEG, uh, we can look at, on the bottom left, brainwave patterns, delta brainwaves, uh, 
uh, beta brain waves and so forth. Not only can we eat light energy, but it's been shown by the research of uh, Fritz Popp that photon emission, meaning light emissions, are actually produced by every single living organism. Um, there's research that points out that even the DNA is possible source of this photon emission, but also is actually not only producing chemical energies like proteins, but the DNA is actually being played almost like a harp because it's actually producing acoustical or sound energy as well. And you have to think, you know, how do you get instantaneous communication? Well, you have to have some sort of wave pattern that can sweep through the body rather quickly. And of course, we know, you know, through um, cell waves and so forth that this communication be, can be quite instantaneous because waves have an infinite uh, possibility or potential to carry information. And then on the bottom right, uh, this is an EKG that we're all, you know, pretty aware of. We know that the heart is actually pumping out information of electrical impulses throughout the body as well. All right, so now we're going to look at some diagnostic methods. So the first question is, which is the best method to explore hormones in the human body? Is it the blood? Is it the urine? Or is it the saliva? And the answer to the question is all of them. So I see all the time, you know, if patients come in and, uh, you know, they'll have one practitioner say that blood is better. Another practitioner will say saliva is much better. And there's a fight between the two. And some even uh, totally disregard uh, saliva testing altogether. And other practitioners will disregard blood work altogether. But we have to understand something. And really, let's think again about how the body produces hormones. So what we said before is that a gland actually produces a hormone. Now, in order for that hormone to travel long distances, it cannot be active. It has to be in a form that is inactive. And that is referred to as protein bound, right? Because if the body or a gland were to make a hormone that is active immediately, it would be used at that same location. It wouldn't be able to travel because it would be used up rather quickly. So the gland produces the initial hormone in what's referred to as a protein bound. And the protein bound simply means that it's able to travel or be carried long distances. Once it gets to the target or destination, the protein disattaches, and now the hormone becomes a free fraction or free. It's a free hormone that can now be used. And then once that hormone is used, it can go through a process back into the liver to be recycled, to be squirted back out, to be possibly used over again. And that's kind of, you know, the a, a general schematic of how hormones are being used in, in, in throughout the human body. So now when you think about it, blood is actually testing the protein bound. So it's actually, you can think of it as what the body is actually producing. Saliva, which is the free fraction, is really telling you what the body is using. Now, there are exceptions. Uh, in particular, there's really one exception in blood. Sometimes you'll see uh, the term free testosterone in the blood, and that's because we can test the free testosterone levels in the blood as well. But for the most part, you know, 90 plus percent of all hormones tested in the blood are going to be protein bound. And 99% of all hormones that are tested in the saliva are going to be free fraction. Now, urine hormone testing does exist. It's not used very often, but it basically shows you the way the body is recycling or breaking down hormones. So, when you look at, okay, what's the best method, you really want a combination. You know, you want blood, you want urine, and you want saliva would ideally be the best way to go about because they're all giving you uh, a little bit different information. So if we were to look at, say, estrogen dominance as an example, and this is a, a condition where there's too much estrogen in relationship to progesterone, is it because the gland is actually producing too much estrogen? So we look at the blood. Are the glands actually producing enough 
estrogen and progesterone in the right amount, but is the body using it in an unusual way? So we could look at the free fraction. Or is everything fine with production and use? And really the biggest issue is the recycling in the liver. Um, a lot of times when the body can't break down the hormones as well as it should, sometimes these intermediate products that are, are, are not supposed to be used are pushed out into the blood. And in the example of estrogen, they have a very, very proliferative or growth stimulating effect on the human body because they're not completely broken down. So if we look here, this is an example of a adrenal stress profile. And what, what happens is, you, you know, you, you get a kit and you would uh, check your saliva throughout the day. Uh, in this particular example, you would do it four particular times during the day at 8 a.m., noon, around 4 o'clock, and then, you know, before bed. And you would get to see, you know, the different levels of hormone production throughout the day. And why this is important is because let's just say that we're testing cortisol as an example. Go to the doctors, get your morning AM cortisol tested, and it's normal. And everything then is said, you know, to be fine and dandy with the adrenal gland. But you wake up in the morning, you're not really that stressed. Uh, maybe the cortisol shows to be a little bit lower than what it should be, but you're not showing the stress response as an example. So let's say we did the saliva now. You collect it in the morning, and let's say the saliva shows normal as well in the morning. But then as the afternoon goes, you become extremely stressed. You begin work, or you know, you're driving in your car, and there's traffic, or whatever it may be. But your body now goes into a fight-or-flight type of response, and now you're going to be able to see that um, in the actual testing. Because remember, blood work is really only testing a snapshot in time. It's really only showing you at the moment that you had your blood work taken. So as an example, again, for, for females uh, who are cycling, I mean, there's really nothing that even comes closer than doing a 30-day challenge to kind of see the hormones that are fluctuating throughout the entire cycle um, of that 30-day uh, period. So now we come to key concept number one. And this states that hormone complexity dictates a multidimensional treatment and not a single drug or hormone replacement therapy option. So the example that I'm about to give is through the eyes of the thyroid gland. And the details are not important. Uh, my point is to walk you through the complexity of the human body to show you why a multidimensional treatment plan is necessary. So bear with me for just a minute or two as I kind of walk you through this and then I'll give you the take home message. So the brain hypothalamus pituitary is picking up low levels of thyroid hormone in the blood. It produces a hormone called TSH or a thyroid stimulating hormone, which then goes to the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland uses nutrients such as tyrosine and iodine and other elements to make thyroid hormones. One is called T4, which is produced in about 80% abundance in the thyroid gland, and it's the inactive form. T3 is about 20% production in thyroid gland, and it's the active form. The 80% production of T4 then travels to the colon, where the gastrointestinal tract, along with the symbiotic relationship of the gut bacteria, help with the conversion of T4 into T3. The T4 travels to the liver, and the liver helps with the conversion of T4 into T3, uh, then to be able to be used by the rest of the body. So here's the point. As if we look at the blood, and we begin to see that there are low levels of thyroid hormone, we really don't know why. It could be an issue with brain communication to the thyroid. It could be an issue with the thyroid not having the substrates or the nutrients to actually make the actual hormones. It could be because the traveling or the gut 
is uh, not working appropriately to help with some of this conversion, or it could be that we're having liver congestion. And on top of all of that, the number one cause, say, of hypothyroidism in the United States is something called Hashimoto's, which has nothing to do uh, with uh, the hormone system. It has all to do with the body's immune system. In fact, you can uh, view one of our other free webinars or lectures on um, just thyroid uh, physiology and treatment. Moving on to key concept number two, it's referred to as tissue saturation. And here, here's what it, what it means. The more hormone replacement therapy you take, the more you increase your reliance. So if we look at tissue saturation and this increased reliance, the first thing we want to talk about is how does our body normally regulate hormones? And it's something that we've already talked about. It's called a, uh, a negative or, or a positive feedback loop. The brain detects either low or high levels of hormones in the blood. Uh, a signal is sent up to the brain and then the brain responds. In the case of low levels, it's going to help with increased production. In the case of high levels, it's going to stop production altogether. So what happens to our endogenous internal production when we take hormone replacement therapy? Well, yeah, if the brain is detecting that there is sufficient amounts of hormone in the blood because you're taking either um, oral supplementation or injections or creams, then what's going to happen is it's going to send a signal back up to the brain that we don't need to make endogenous production of hormones anymore. And so it slowly stops our production. And that's why over time, you know, as an example with people who are, have, you know, hypothyroid, that you will typically see the TSH numbers keep going down because the body no longer needs to stimulate the hormone uh, gland anymore. So what happens, the third and final question, what happens when you try to come off hormone replacement therapy is that you have to have complete awareness that when you try to come off a hormone, what's going to happen is it's going to take a period of time. And this is really dependent upon the amount of time that you've already been on hormones. You know, of course, if you've been on it for years, it's going to take a lot longer to stimulate your body's endogenous production. And this is where people get trapped or I call incarceration because when they try to come off this hormone replacement therapy, right, they, they first of all start to get horrible signs and symptoms because their body is just not up to par in making the hormones. And in doing so, it's hard to get through those weeks or even months um, to get their hormones back to regulation. And so they will automatically go back on the hormone replacement therapy. And again, they're, they're in some ways incarcerated for life. There is a way to do this, however, um, in a more holistic manner, um, and that really involves increasing the holistic treatment parameters at the same time you're decreasing the conventional or traditional hormone replacement therapy as to avoid these types of uh, issues uh, that are seen with uh, tissue saturation. So when we look at ways of administration, we can take hormones and pills. Um, this does have to go through the liver in order to be cleared. Only about 10% is used. It's usually in that protein or bound form or the inactive form. And it does cause the tissue saturation. And over time, we will then need more and more of the hormone to get the beneficial effect uh, that we are uh, looking for. Uh, liquid has some advantages. Um, it does avoid liver clearance, so it doesn't have to go through the gastrointestinal tract to be uh, used. Um, and in some ways, it really doesn't cause as much tissue saturation. So it's a safer uh, form or administration to, to be used initially. It's coming in the free form, so that way it's used uh, rather quickly. And it does not store in the body. Uh, it's a you know, half-life of about eight hours. Um, so the one advantage or disadvantage, depending on how you're looking at, is that you need it more frequently. Topical, uh, 
also avoid liver clearance, meaning the ability that the liver has to break it down and, and go through uh, uh, recycling. But it does cause tissue saturation. Uh, the hormones can store in fat, and the body really has absolutely no choice but, but to use the topical when, when you're putting it on. So key concept number three is that treatment should be given to treat the cause rather than the symptom. So one of the best examples that I think we can look at is the body's accumulation of fat and how it relays to hormone production. So let's give an example of a 50 year old male who goes to the doctor he is coming in with signs and symptoms of increased body fat, uh, weight related issues. But the main reason he's there to see the endocrinologist is because of uh, loss of libido or sex drive. So they run some hormone testing and they find out that this particular patient has low levels of testosterone. So he decides to, as a first line intervention, he decides to give them testosterone. And of course, that's going to cause more tissue saturation. It's going to shut his internal production of testosterone off, and it's really not fixing the problem. So one of the interesting things that we know is that when there's an increase in adipose tissue, which is fat tissue in the human body for men, what will happen is, is that testosterone will go inside as it's produced, will go inside um, the fat tissue and will come out the other end uh, transferred or transformed into estrogen through an enzyme or enzyme activity called uh, aromatase in men. And this is why when you see really obese men, you'll see that they start to get some feminizing features. And what happens again is that increased body fat is going to steal the testosterone and get it converted into estrogen. In women, uh, the same thing happens, but it's reversed. So as women put on more body fat or adipose tissue, what will happen is their estrogen through an enzyme called 1720 lyase in their adipose or fat tissue is going to convert that estrogen into testosterone. So what we see with really obese women is they begin to get masculizing features such as facial hair and so forth. And in men, they feminize and get the breast production and so forth. So again, when you look at uh, what's happening and you go to the doctor's office and you're finding, say, for somebody who's just simply overweight, for men, low testosterone or women uh, coming in with, you know, uh, higher testosterone and low estrogen, what really the first line intervention, of course, should be diet and lifestyle modifications in an effort to reduce uh, the fat or adipose deposition. So kind of a, you know, a trivia question, but what is the largest endocrine organ in the human body? And the answer is actually our fat tissue. Um, if you look at uh, some research here, they've identified uh, over 25 different types of hormones that are actually produced by the fat tissue. So this has to be an integral component of any treatment plan when we're looking at cause. And this is just common sense and rules of reasonableness when we're talking about uh, treatment uh, that is based upon uh, diet and lifestyle rather than incarceration with hormone replacement therapy. So key concept four is that hormone, it's controversial, but hormone replacement therapy and bioidentical hormones are simply not bioidentical. I like to use the analogy uh, of these sugar packets called sugar in the raw. If you've ever looked at them, uh, you'll see sugar in the raw, and then on top of it, there'll be a little TM or trademark name. Of course, because sugar does not exist in the raw in nature. Right? They're going to be coming from beets um, or they're going to be coming from corn or whatever it may be coming. But sugar doesn't exist in raw. And it's the same thing. You have doctors and you have the pharmaceutical industry calling these bioidentical. Um, 
The precursors are made from a plant, as in the example of estrogen from wild yam and soy. They are actually synthesized in a laboratory. When you are given this hormone cream, the body literally has no choice but to use it since it's in its free form. Uh, and remember, usually a real hormone is bound and the body can regulate when and where it should use it based upon its needs so that it breaks away that protein bound into the free fraction form that we talked about uh, before. And the thing is, you know, really, haven't we learned? You know, we can see uh, from some of the nutritional studies, like the longest, you know, nutritional studies ever performed in human history, like the China study, is that when you are exposed to quote unquote real bioidentical uh, hormones, meaning your endogenous production, we're going to show decreases in the rates of cancer and diabetes and heart disease and increased longevity and decreased aging. But when we look at you know uh, these other studies, like the Women's Health Initiative study, what we're finding is that you know Premarin uh, in the 1940s was isolated from the urine of pregnant mares. And um, it is linked to breast and uterine cancers, heart disease, and stroke. And one of the reasons is because when we looked at those mechanisms of communication, it really wasn't fitting into that lock and key mechanism. And what it was doing, it was just causing more of an excessive uh, type of um, response. So key concept number five is really starting or possibly looking toward the adrenal glands as a first line intervention. Um, the adrenal glands sit on top of your kidney and they produce uh, lots of different hormones. Two in particular that most people are aware of is cortisol, which is what we refer to as the stress hormone. And then also uh, DHEA, which is the sex hormone or precursors to other types of sex hormone. But you know, when we get dysregulation in, in the adrenal glands uh, due to stress, we can get a whole host of different you know, signs and symptoms as well as diagnoses like depression and arthritis and obesity, irritable bowel syndrome and cancers and so forth. But the thing is, is that when we are age 18, uh, 16, 15, um, our sex hormone production is going to be happening because no matter what we're doing, you know, if we have a poor diet, a poor lifestyle, we're into drugs, we're still going to go through puberty and we're still going to be producing our sex hormones. So in guys, the testes are still going to be putting out testosterone and women, the uterus and the breast tissues are going to be making uh, their hormones. But, you know, after a certain age, you know, the fourth decade or so of life or an after, we get a decreased production of sex hormone. Uh, from our sex glands towards the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands are now taking up the grunt of most of our sex hormone production. And this is, of course, almost 100% in the case of people who have gotten you know, partial or total hysterectomy. Um, the adrenal glands are now picking up most of the slack. But the thing here is that there's a competition because every time your body goes into a stress response, whether it's real or imagined, uh, whether it's a thought, whether it's poor diet, whether it's lack of exercise, it's now going to be at the expense. Every time your body produces cortisol, it's not going to be producing sex hormone production. And that's why the adrenal glands is a must in any type of hormone multidimensional treatment plan. And in some cases, it truly is the causative nature of most hormone dysfunctions that we are seeing. So getting a real good hold on uh, your adrenal gland, uh, a real true assessment, meaning through the saliva and the blood, is going to be so pertinent uh, to your success for hormone replacement. Uh, key concept number six uh, states that your diet and lifestyle directly influence uh, your hormone production. So you remember we talked about you know, the lock and key mechanism and in the cell membrane, there are these receptor sites. Well, if you look at the cell membrane, uh, you know, look all the way to the far left, they're made up of what's referred to as a phospholipid bilayer. And it, the cell membrane needs to be fluid. 
it needs to be able to pass information from the outside to the inside of the cell. And so it needs to be made up of the right type of fats. So when you look at, as an example, uh, saturated fat versus unsaturated fat. Saturated fat primarily comes from animal flesh and animal secretion. And really, it's a, a carbon uh, backbone that's saturated with uh, hydrogen, as you can see in, in the picture uh, on the top. And really, all that means is that, you know, all the carbons actually, there's, there's, there's no kink in that structure. And so they're going to be solid at room temperature. Unsaturated, right, monounsaturated means that there's one kink. Um, that not all of the areas are saturated with hydrogen. And that little kink allows it to be more liquid at room temperature, say like olive oil. So when we add, uh, going back to this slide, saturated fats to this uh, cell membrane, we make it more rigid. When we add you know, plant-based type of fats, um, to the cell membrane, we make it more fluid and more dynamic. And that's the reason why whole food plant-based nutrition is going to be far superior, uh, not only because there are no, um, you know, exogenous uh, hormone that are being put into the food supply uh, at the lower we go down the food chain, but it also has to do with this phenomenon of saturated uh, versus unsaturated uh, fats. All right, now we come to treatment. So we got a five-step protocol or framework that I hope you will use uh, in your thought process as you, you, as you go through uh, hormone treatment. So the first step is really to get rid of the xenobiotics, these substances that are foreign to life. And there really is no better way to do this than through a detoxification program that is particularly targeting uh, the gastrointestinal tract as well as the liver and the kidney. So you want to look at all those different aspects and, and be able to, to target uh, a good detoxification program to eliminate as much exogenous intake of hormones uh, from the outside world in. The second step is common sense. You need to get on the right type of diet and lifestyle approach. So we recommend a whole food plant-based diet uh, for a number of reasons, uh, in particular to hormones, eating the lowest on the food chain is going to ensure that you are taking in the least amount of exogenous production of hormones from the outside world in. And plants, of course, have so many other uh, beneficial phytonutrients, antioxidants, and so forth that can combat some of the, re the free radical production in the body. So you want to jump from the detox into a whole food plant-based diet. Um, you want to pay particular attention to something called chronobiology. And this is really getting in sync with the cycles of um, the earth, the sun, and the moon. Um, there's a, a reason why when we wake up in the morning, um, we get high levels of cortisol production. And then throughout the day, we get a dip and then we get uh, higher levels now of melatonin production as the night goes on. And it has to do with the light intake. So photoreceptors on our eyes are going to be picking up light as we wake up in the morning and a certain level of hormones are going to be produced. And then as the day goes on, uh, as the light goes dimmer and dimmer, uh, we're now going to turn on a different hormone passage away, which is going to allow for melatonin production. And of course, today, in, in the world that we live in, we have artificial light up until the very moment we go to bed. It's like we're telling our body it's daytime, and then boom, you close the TV and the light, and it's supposed to somehow immediately switch over to production of hormones for the evening. And so there are many, many different techniques, uh, but chronobiology, one of the best ways to kind of start the process of reprogramming is to get your sleep patterns synced. Prepare your home, prepare your bed uh, for, for sleep by decreasing or dimming the lights before going to bed. And of course, not using TVs or your cell phone or being on a computer uh, moments before getting ready to go to sleep. Exercise is critical, um, especially, you know, when you look at the different components of exercise, we got aerobic, 
we got strength training, we got flexibility, but you know, all of these different components help to speak to the hypothalamus and the pituitary for production of growth hormone, uh, for sex hormone production. And so exercise is really key. And one of the things that we like to do is look at some testing for the, the different body types that exist and find out what is the best formula of aerobic strength and flexibility training for your particular body type to help with stimulation of your body's metabolism. After you do that, right, now you're ready to do saliva and some blood testing, right? Because if you, if you don't do these things first, what you're testing is simply your body's poor dietary and lifestyle habits. Um, so it really makes sense to kind of get involved with doing the cleansing first and getting at least started on the right type of diet and exercise program and then to do the testing so you can really see where the dysfunctions are rather than looking at the blood and the saliva testing to see really where the dysfunctions of your diet and lifestyle are. So you do the saliva testing and blood testing that we talked about and then from there you want a very systematic approach uh, of supplementation whereby you're going to go from non-invasive to invasive in that order, right? So you want to fail the non-invasive approaches first before jumping into, say, hormone replacement therapy because that's step five, even if you get there. So the first thing you want to do is to support the adrenal glands that we talked about. You want to use adaptogenic botanicals. And again, these are substances that are found in nature that will literally adapt to the environment of which they're in. So like, for example, there's a root vegetable called maca. If a male takes it and he has low testosterone, it's going to stimulate the male's body to produce testosterone. But if a woman takes maca and she has low levels of uh, progesterone, it's going to help her body to stimulate uh, progesterone. And that's why they call them adaptogenic. And that's why males and females uh, can both take them. But that's the first line intervention, right, is adrenal support and adaptogenic botanicals, you know, based upon your saliva and blood testing. And of course, you want to support other body systems, you know, like the liver and the gastrointestinal system and the essential fatty acids and so forth uh, that make up the phospholipid bilayers and, and the brain. Um, which is really an important part of this whole treatment uh, protocol. And even within the supplement realm, right, after you use adrenals and adaptogenic, then you'd want to always, if, you're, if you are going to be choosing, you know, to use hormone replacement therapy, right, we talked about the different uh, ways that you can administer, you know, oral, or you can administer, you know, topical or liquid. And even within hormone replacement therapy, you probably want to start out with the liquid first, primarily because it doesn't cause as much tissue saturation as the other two. So that's kind of a schematic uh, or just a general approach uh, that you're wanting to kind of look as you kind of walk yourself through uh, hormone treatment. You know, there's all sorts of different supplements that are out there. Uh, you know, group one supplements like uh, Tribulus and Maca and Ginseng. Um, these supplements are, are really helpful in increasing, you know, testosterone or even increasing testosterone. Uh, group two, uh, Shepherd's Purse and Chase Tree. In women, this is particularly important to help with increasing progesterone levels. Group three, those are substances that really help uh, with the liver breaking down the estrogen if that seems to be an issue where it's really more of a recycling related issue. Ginseng and ashwagandha, rhodiolio, these are uh, herbs that uh, really help with adrenals. Uh, Saw so palmetto and stinging nettle and flower pollen, these are, these are great for the prostate. So the longest lived people, you know, kind of want to, you know, end with this particular slide here. Um, but we have, you know, a couple books here. One is uh, Healthy at 100 by John Robbins and the Blue Zones, and there's, there's others. But, you know, the longest lived people on planet Earth to date have not taken hormone replacement treatments. They have a certain level of dietary and lifestyle achievements. They have social structures that are in place. Uh, they have strong familial connections. Mostly all of them are eating a plant-based type of diet. Uh, work and, uh, 
you know, just your normal day-to-day -day activity is intertwined, and so they're extremely active. And so we want to use this as the model for helping with balancing our hormones rather than relying on some sort of pharmaceutical agent uh, to help with balancing our hormone production. So I want to thank you for joining me in this uh, webinar and this lecture. And if you do have any questions, you can jump on to our website at www.drripoli.com and uh, email me any questions that you have. Again, thanks so much uh, for tuning in and listening.